Great. Okay, so I say let's get started then. And uh, I'll just start by thanking you again, William, for joining us. And uh, and thanks everybody for attending. We've got nice turnout here. Um, just by way of introduction, so um, William did his PhD at NYU and is now based at the Molly Crockett Lab at Yale University as a postdoc. And I would say uh, he's... Um, an excellent example of this new generation of behavioral scientists who are not intimidated by programming and by uh, learning or teaching themselves uh, techniques from other fields, computational techniques, whether it's uh, natural language processing, which I think you've made a lot of use of, or machine learning and so on. And I think that the future is basically going to be, um, well, the future of behavioral science is if we are, is going to be computational, if we are going to be, uh, take advantage of all of these new data sets and, and really analyzing data from ecological uh, sort of settings, such as actual social media uh, use. And I think that the topic that you're working on is probably at the forefront of everybody's mind, because it's something we experience every day. We see moral outrage. We wonder why people are behaving this way. And we wonder what it would have been like if people behave the same way in the physical world. And we, you know, it's kind of often very baffling. Um, so shedding light on this, which we, you know, I think is, is an important uh, objective and in particular kind of goes the way all the way up to the kind of the structure of society, if you like, you know, the norms that govern the way that we make decisions collectively. So, um, so I think it's an important topic and I'm excited and I'm sure everybody else here is to hear what you have to say. So I'll hand over to you. Great. Thanks so much for the introduction and definitely excited to be here for this group. It's a shame I couldn't um, come out and visit. Uh, Berlin's one of my favorite cities, but uh, it is pretty neat to be able to just wake up and then give a talk in another country <laughs> an hour later. Um, but yeah, so I'm going to be talking about moral emotions in the digital age. And I think it's good to start with an example of what I mean by moral emotions. I usually ask for audience participation. Um, I don't know if there's a chat function, but we can, um, you can think about it. So in 2018, the Trump administration announced the, what was called the zero tolerance policy and this policy prosecuted people crossing the U.S.-Mexico border in a way that led to the separations of families and lots of them with young children. So think to yourself, or if there's a chat function, you could write this down. An emotional word that describes how this crisis, if you were aware of it, made you feel. And usually what happens when I ask, especially Americans, but you might be thinking this as well, is that you see a lot of strong negative emotions in terms of what people think about this crisis, how it makes them feel. But one of the assumptions that I have is that the majority of people who I ask this question, they have no direct personal experience actually at the border. And so what this demonstration shows is a fundamental aspect of human social cognition. We have the ability to feel emotions in response to situations that go beyond our immediate self-interest. And this is often based off of our conception of what is good or bad for society. Philosophers in the 1700s, like Hume and Adam Smith, they argued that this ability to feel these moral emotions serves as the foundation for human morality. So these are really important emotions. And in the past three decades, there's been a lot of important work that has helped us answer the question of when and why we experience moral emotions. And I'll be focusing on the social psychology and the effective science side of things here. So there's appraisal theories that have helped outline the specific evaluations that elicit and distinguish moral emotions. There's also models that tie specific moral judgments across cultures, uh, tie specific emotions to moral judgments across cultures. And then there's work that examines functional outcomes of moral emotions. So what are the social goals that these emotions accomplish and how does this operate at the group level? And these theories were developed to understand moral emotions in the context of individual and small group settings. Rightly so, because these are the environments that, of course, shaped our moral emotions throughout the history of human evolution. 
But at the same time, these models were developed before the explosion of these new digital contexts like online social networks. And these new contexts, it seems like, have shaped our moral emotions in new and interesting ways. So more specifically, what I mean is that online social networks are a unique social context. They depart from our historical social environment in at least three important ways. These are the ones that I'll focus on. First, large group size. Online social networks embed us in groups that are orders of magnitude larger than the small groups of our past. And I've argued that this makes our group identity hyper salient. And so we're highly aware of different identities we have as group members because of the, the large groups. This has many consequences for how we communicate. Second, social feedback is delivered to us in a way that makes it very salient and also directly quantifiable. We're very aware of how much social feedback we're getting in terms of likes and social reward. And this setup can reward us for certain expressions over others, almost like we're in a digital Skinner box. And then finally, the way that there are communication constraints on in these platforms. So we have to communicate as an all computer mediated communication via symbolic representation. And this makes us abstract away from the diversity of cues that we could use in face-to-face -face interaction to communicate to a restricted set of words and symbols. And I argue, as you'll see in the talk, that this can have major implications for interpersonal perception, especially when it comes to emotions. So how do all these characteristics impact moral emotions at the broad level? Well, there's 4 billion of us now who are active on social media. And if you're on these platforms, especially some of them like tw Twitter and Facebook, you know that there's something amplified about the way moral emotions are expressed and shared. We've seen the viral spread of moral emotions underlying social movements like the Me Too movement that was about um, uh, raising awareness of how women are treated and women's rights. But at the same time, we've also seen that more, the spread of moral outrage has made people um, feel harassed. We've seen women and minorities harassed by outrage disproportionately compared to other groups. And it has led to some people leaving the platforms. And besides this, there's, of course, the spread of disinformation. This often tries to evoke moral emotions and sow intergroup conflict. Um, world leaders use social media as a tool to evoke moral outrage against outgroups. And when you have these negative moral emotions spreading around, you get in a lot of countries, uh, historical levels of effective polarization. And what I mean by effective polarization are negative feelings toward political outgroups. And the US is one of the worst cases of these when you look at uh, country level effective polarization, but you see it in many other countries, including in Europe. Germany is actually one where you don't see a rising trend as much as the US. But what you do see in a lot of countries is still this growth in um, extremism, political extremism. And some Pew research I was reading uh, yesterday was suggesting that far right wing groups in Germany trust news media less than other groups. So they turn to social media for um, communication. So taking all of this into consideration, I think there's a pressing need to understand how these digital social contexts are impacting our moral and also our emotional lives and what consequences this has for intergroup relations. So today I'll present some of my work that helps us understand specifically how online social networks amplify moral emotions. And typically when I give this talk, I do it in three parts. And I usually start by looking at how online social networks amplify the contagion of moral emotions. And what I argue is that social media platforms make our political group identities highly salient. And what this means is that it makes us more likely to share moral emotions and spread them because they serve group identity functions. I'm actually going to skip over this section for today, but if you have questions, we can talk about it in the follow up. And instead, I'll focus on uh, these last two parts. So first, I'll talk about research documenting how the feedback delivery system of online social networks, the social feedback delivery system. It exploits social learning processes that can amplify the expression of moral emotions. And then in the last section, I'll discuss some uh, very new research that's examining how constraints of social media communication can amplify 
the perception of moral emotions. And we'll think about how these processes can impact intergroup relations. And this last section, I'm really excited because it's brand new stuff, not polished at all, but I'm really, really um, excited to get your feedback so you think about it. But we'll start with this um, first section, how social media amplifies the expression of moral emotions. So moving forward, I'm going to be focusing on a specific moral emotion, and that is moral outrage, which I think is really important for the context of intergroup relations, morality, and politics. So moral outrage is typically described as an experience. It's a mixture of anger and disgust, and it is elicited by perceived transgression against a moral norm. It's associate, associated with norm enforcement, and importantly, it has the potential to raise awareness of moral issues, move social norms, but again, it also has a sort of a double-edged sword. It also has a lot of these downsides, like limiting participation if it gets out of hand. So I think it's really important because um, of the role that it plays in moral and political discourse. So how does social media amplify moral outrage expression potentially? What we argue is that this occurs through two key forms of social learning that are very relevant to social media. So first, people can fine tune their outrage expression through reinforcement learning. In other words, altering expressive behaviors in response to positive or negative social feedback. The social feedback delivery system that is sort of a key of all the social media platforms, like getting likes and shares, it really facilitates our ability to learn from the feedback because it's highly salient. We always get notifications. We see it when we're on the platform and it's very quantifiable. We know exactly how much we're getting for a given post that we do. Secondly, people can adjust their moral outrage expressions through norm learning. In other words, matching their expressions to what they infer is normative among their peers, and they're doing this through observational learning. On social media, users self-organize into like-minded groups, like-minded social networks, and all of these networks have their own local norms of how to express oneself. The newsfeed design of social media displays these local norms of expressions very saliently every time you log in. And this, of course, can heavily guide norm learning. So in the studies I'll talk about today, we tested the impact of both reinforcement learning and norm learning on social media. And we looked to see how could this potentially um, impact outrage across two observational studies where we looked at real social media behavior on Twitter. And then we did two confirmatory behavioral experiments where we created a, a mock social media environment to better test causality. So we'll start with the observational studies. And what we did here is collected the tweet histories of a bunch of users who were discussing um, uh, political, contentious political topics in American politics. And we wanted to measure their outrage expression and also the social feedback they got to look at how um, expressing outrage and getting social feedback are associated over time. And so the first problem to solve when you want to study outrage expression on social media is figuring out how can you measure it at scale in an accurate way. We're dealing with millions of tweets that we want to study. So we did this by using advances in natural language processing and supervised machine learning. And in some of my previous work, I've used um, lexicon methods that count the number of words associated with the category, but these uh, methods have a notable advantage because they can account for semantic context. And actually, a lot of these methods are actually um, language neutral, which I can talk about later if you have more interest. But basically what we're doing, we tr have a big data set, 26,000 tweets that were collected because they were communications about contentious political topics. And we had them labeled for outrage by trained annotators. We trained them based on uh, emotion science theory to identify outrage. And broadly, what our model does is learn the linguistic features that are associated with outrage expression, and then it can make predictions about new tweets for whether it contains outrage. And if you have more questions about this model, I can talk about it in the Q&A. But it performs uh, fairly accurately. In fact, um, it performs as well as other sort of state-of-the-art sentiment analysis methods. Here you can see some examples of what that outrage looks like. These are predictions from our model and 
these are tweets that were directed at political elites and political pundits in the United States. You can see there's a lot of face validity here. A lot of it gets kind of nasty, but these are examples of moral outrage. And you're looking for, you know, this anger and disgust, this implied moral context, and also sometimes um, mentions of wanting to punish people, things like that. So then... So Oh, good. Just, a quick, just a quick question. When you say that it compares uh, well with um, state of the art sentiment analysis, what do you mean by that? That there's a correlation? Yeah. So, what I mean is you can test the performance of classifiers, and many of you in the audience might be familiar with this, um, using different types of metrics. So, one of the ways you do it is by a method called cross validation, where you basically take a um, you train your model on a set and you have a holdout set that is not trained on. You can then, and all of these um, sets are labeled. So you have a sort of baseline truth, right? And then you can see how does your model perform out of sample in this holdout set. And you can measure accuracy and you can also measure something that we like called, which is an F1 score. Basically, it's this uh, ratio of, of different ways of, um, of, false alarms, false negatives, et cetera. And what I mean when I said that it performs as well as other sentiment analysis classifiers is our accuracies and our F1 scores are on par with those. And a lot of the existing um, sentiment classifiers are, are, are much more broad than what we're classifying. They're looking at sort of like positive, negative valence. So I think, you know, those have a little bit of an easier time because the content is more general. But when it comes to more specific things like classifiers looking to detect hate speech, looking to detect um, you know, other more specific psychological constructs, the accuracy has really started to come down. So we're pretty happy with the performance we're getting so far. Um, and just to put that in perspective, our, our accuracies are in the range of like 75%. So it's definitely not a perfect classification um, you know, metric, but you know, we do as well as you can expect from these complex psychological uh, constructs, at least using the methods that we're using. Great. So I hope um, I hope that answered the question. I think I, I might have lost you. So for data collection, uh, we first identified users who appeared in our large training data set. And again, these are users who tweeted about contentious political topics in American politics, not that they expressed outrage, but that they tweeted about a political event. So you could call these um, politically active users. And we thought that this is a good test case to find a high signal of outrage because these are users who are ostensibly politically active. And we collected a less active set of users as sort of a control set who were discussing a uh, event in the US that elicited outrage that wasn't very politically partisan, which is actually quite a rare thing to find. And this was the um, United Airlines passenger mistreatment video, which went viral a number of years ago. Some of you might remember this, but basically a passenger was getting dragged off of the, the flight by American Airlines. He was like bleeding. It was a big thing. Everyone was outraged about it. So we then have these users, we collect their entire tweet histories by connecting to Twitter's premium API. And so by doing so, we know how much social feedback all their tweets received. And then we can apply our outrage classifier to all the tweets and we can start to investigate this relationship. So more specifically, what we're testing in this and these uh, first models are whether social reinforcement is associated with variation in outrage expression. And so more specifically, we set up a model that asks whether previous social feedback that people receive, so getting likes and getting shares when they express outrage, predicts their current outrage expression over time. And in these models, we're really trying our best to control for important confounds. So we're controlling for autocorrelation effects of previous outrage expression because there are individual differences in outrage that obviously will predict your future outrage expression. We also model date as a random effect because there are various things going on in the world that can impact people's outrage expression. And then there's other covariates that are known to impact uh, feedback, like how many followers user have. And what we find in these models are 
pretty small but consistent linear effects where previous social feedback is predicting current outrage expression. Now this effect size is small, so it's translating to about a 2% expected increase in outrage expression um, based on the feedback that they got previously. And again, this is small, but this is all at the level of day to day. And so over time, you can imagine how this could very easily build up or at the population level, if everyone's outrage expression is varying at this rate, well, with the extent of social feedback, then you might find notable population level increases. But overall, I think these results are impressive because it suggests that outrage expression is associated with previous social feedback over and above variation in daily events and individual tendencies to express outrage. Now, the next thing that we tested was whether outrage expression was associated with norm learning. And the way that we did this in the context of this, these observational studies was by measuring the ideological extremity of every user's social network. And we wanted to do this as a proxy for norms of outrage expression under the assumption that people who are in more extreme networks are likely to have greater norms of outrage expression in that network. And the way that we did this was based off of big data collection effort where we're collecting all the friends and followers of users in our data set. And then we leverage an algorithm that tracks which political account a user follows. And that allows us to estimate the mean ideological extremity of every user and then therefore get the mean of their entire network. And so here what I'm showing you are the distributions of the mean ideological extremity of each user's network based on data sets. And so it's a little bit of a kind of sanity check here because what we see is the users who we collected who were politically active, uh, these were users who tweeted about the, uh, the Brett Kavanaugh Supreme Court hearings in the United States. This is a very controversial time. Um, these are the users in blue and you can see that they have, their tend to be embedded in more extreme social networks. Whereas users from the United Airlines set, um, they're embedded within less ideologically extreme networks. But the reason why this is important is that what we find is both between and within data sets, the users who were in more ideologically extreme networks express significantly more moral outrage. And the key is that this pattern that I'm showing you emerges even when you control for a user's own political ideology. And this is suggesting that users express outrage in ways that conform to the extremity of their network even beyond their own preferences. And I think that has really interesting implications. The other interesting thing to note is that we find consistently across both of our data sets that the more extreme the user's network was, actually the less previous social feedback was associated with outrage expression. And so here what I'm plotting is the social reinforcement effect size as a function of how extreme a user's network was. And what we can see is that the effect size decreases pretty linearly for both of the groups. And so what we interpret this to mean is that when norm information is very salient in the social environment, people don't need to rely on the social reinforcement to guide their expressive behaviors as much. They have the information available in terms of the norm information. So people are flexibly relying on different types of social information, depending on what is the most salient in their environment. So across both of these studies, what we're seeing is evidence that social reinforcement and norm learning are interacting to predict outrage expression over time. And, you know, these studies have high ecological validity. They're naturally occurring conversations, but of course they are observational, so we can't infer causality. We also couldn't directly measure perception of norms. Again, we were using uh, ideological extremity as a proxy. So to get around these limitations, we, followed up these studies with confirmatory experiments. And in these experiments, what we're doing is creating a simulated Twitter environment in an online browser where we're directly manipulating social feedback that people get for posting a tweet. And also we're manipulating the perception of norms. So the way that this works is we have participants first spend time viewing tweets from an ostensible social network that they're thrown into. And so we had them scroll in this, this news feed that we constructed through tweets that were, or news feeds that were either majority outrage or they were, did not have any outrage. And what we're doing here is manipulating the perceived norm of outrage expression in the social network. 
And the tweets that appeared in these news feeds are actually real tweets that were captured from our outreach classifier in the previous study. So we're just piping them straight in as stimuli. So after this manipulation, participants then complete a learning task where they're instructed to share uh, one of two tweets on multiple trials in a way that maximizes their social feedback. And the learning task was actually the same for both conditions. And what we're doing is we're manipulating feedback such that on average, if a participant chooses to share or post an outrage tweet, they're getting uh, more likes. And the likes were drawn from noisy distribution. So this is actually not a super easy learning task. It takes many trials to figure out what's going on here. So what we find in this study is that both reinforcement learning and norm learning indeed impact outrage expression. And so what I'm plotting is the percentage of participants who chose to share outrage tweets for each condition and over each trial. And the first pattern to note is that in both of the conditions, participants are learning to increase their outrage expression over time based on the social feedback that they're receiving. And so this finding is replicating this social reinforcement finding that we see on Twitter. But one of the things that's also clear is that on the very first trial, people have inferred different norms of expressions based on the newsfeed that they viewed. And so in other words, if you were in the outrage condition and you viewed that newsfeed, you're much more likely to choose outrage on the very first trial than participants in the neutral norm condition. But what we also see finally is that these two processes interact. So we replicate these Twitter studies to find that when norm learning was providing information that already helped maximize social feedback, social value, participants were less sensitive to the social feedback on the trial by trial basis. And so again, these findings are replicating the observational studies in Twitter, but in this case, we can validly infer that social feedback and norm learning are causing changes in outrage expression, which is, which is nice to look at. So in summary for this first part of the talk, what we're seeing is evidence that past social reinforcement explains significant variance in people's outrage expression. And this is some of the first empirical evidence documenting how the feedback delivery system that is a key part of social media can play a role in our online moral and emotional behaviors. We also see evidence that norm learning can impact outrage expression and even moderate the extent to which people rely on social reinforcement. And again, this is suggesting that people flexibly rely on different social learning mechanisms depending on the context of their social network. And I think this also highlights why studying reinforcement learning on social media is really fascinating because it's allowing us to answer these new questions about how there's an interaction between reward learning on one hand and norm learning on the other. And the last thing I'll say in summary is that Studying these social learning processes is actually quite unique on social media. And the reason is because both of these processes that I've been talking about are actually directly impacted by content algorithms. So <clears throat> if our newsfeed algorithm feeds us more controversial content because it thinks we'll engage with it more, we might actually perceive that the norms of expression from our newsfeed are more extreme than they really are in our network. And this might make us think that this can have an impact on various uh, group level processes, which I'll be discussing directly in the next section of the talk. So I'll pause here to ask if there's any uh, questions. And if not, uh, we can wait till the end. Great. So in the last section, what I'll be discussing is research on how social media amplifies the perception of moral emotions. So again, talking a little bit about what I mentioned a few slides ago, when people are learning socially, uh, when they're learning from social information, it's not necessarily a pure signal of social information. And so as an example of what I mean by that, you know, we can log onto our news feeds, we can see what types of what people are saying, what types of expressions are frequent and normative. But the posts that we see, again, can be upranked based on these platform algorithms. So they're usually, especially on Twitter, for example, upranked based on engagement. And on platforms like Facebook and Twitter, what this means in practice is that inflammatory and emotional content constantly gets upranked. These 
types of content tend to draw more engagement, which I've shown in some previous work. And so what this can mean is that the frequency and intensity of outrage and other polarizing content is not necessarily representative of the true feelings when we consider our social network as a whole. We're getting this exaggerated sense of how extreme or how outraged our network is based on the behavior of the algorithms. And one interesting thing to ask, um, which we're doing now as a side note, is to what extent people are actually even aware of how these algorithms impact their, their social news feeds. So I can talk about that later in the discussion. But the idea of what I just described can be more precisely um, um, discussed as, as the concept of pluralistic ignorance. And what this concept refers to is a mistaken impression about how people think and feel. And, and this is importantly a socially shared pattern that emerges at the group level. And this was introduced in the early 1920s by a foundational social psychologist. And usually in psychology, pluralistic ignorance is discussed as something that's driven by a perceptual distortion of accurate information. So it's really the, a, a problem with the bias that biases that you know, we have as humans. But in the communications literature, it's talked about in a slightly different way, which is that pluralistic ignorance is driven by veridical perception of information that gets distorted by features of the social inf environment. And I think both of these sources are really important. So I, I try to combine these two and we can think about pluralistic ignorance driven by a combination of both misperception and distortion of information from the social environment. And when we talk about uh, moral outrage, that could actually be from people expressing, for example, more outrage than they actually feel. This would be um, a distortion created from the source. So why might we think that overperception of outrage could be exacerbated by the social media environment? And here what I focus on is the communication the way that uh, we have to communicate on social media. So when we communicate our emotions, it happens through language and images. And this departure from face-to-face -face communication is actually really important because in face-to-face -face interactions, emotion expressions, uh, emotions are expressed through many channels with a huge variety in terms of the intensity and the form. But when we have to express our emotions through language, it can act as a way of reducing the dimensionality of emotion expression because it makes the options available for expression relatively less complex. So basically you can see like in the example of this image, there's all kinds of channels of communication that give us nuance in how we express emotions and face-to-face -face communication. We have to filter that down to saying, I'm so annoyed in these very specific concepts and uh, linguistic options. And so on one hand, you might think that this could generally lead to less accuracy in emotion perception because we're losing a lot of information potentially. But what I argue for is a more specific hypothesis, which is that emotions are likely to be perceived more in tune with norms of the environment. And another way to think about this is that when we perceive emotions in language, and there's lots of work in effective science that's, that look at this, we have to employ specific emotion concepts that are sort of shared in our, our, our cultural group. And we know that concepts are very tied to specific contexts. This is the idea of situated conceptualization. And so the idea is that our baseline perceptual inference when we're perceiving emotions will be based on the expressions that are most frequently appearing in the context of our network. And so this leads to a specific hypothesis that on social media, especially these platforms like Twitter and Facebook, where high arousal emotional language spreads rapidly, people are likely to perceive expressions in line with what they're seeing frequently. And so that suggests that high arousal negative emotions will be perceived uh, more frequently or more intensely than they're actually felt by the people who are sending them. So in terms of the overexpression side, why might that happen? Well, some of my previous work has looked at how there are lots of intergroup motivations that can influence the expression of outrage. And in particular, I've looked at the motivations we have in terms of social identity theory. So we have these strong motivations as humans to really 
protect the group image that we identify with. So say I'm an American Democrat, um, my behaviors and my emotions will often act in ways that uh, try to make that group look good. And this is especially true in these contexts where our group identities are very salient, like on social media. And the idea here is that expressing moral emotions like outrage can really serve that function of protecting and maintaining our group identity. When we see information from a political outgroup that is putting our group down, we can derogate the outgroup through outrage expression, and this is making our group look better, protecting our interests. And also, when we know from some previous work that when people express outrage, it actually can boost their moral reputation as an expressor. People assume that this person is more trustworthy, that they're more uh, moral, they're a better partner. And the other thing I like to point out with this image is that when we perceive, perceive emotions and express emotions on social media, it's a very unique situation because we have no privileged information into what a person is actually doing or feeling when they're at their phone or their computer. Like this person, Chad White, he's seemingly not feeling anything when we look at his actual picture. But when we look at the text, he can just type this and we just have to assume that this person is very outraged because all we have to, to perceive is the actual text that he's sending. So I think this creates a very interesting environment where you might have over perception, uh, sorry, over expression. So the way that we wanted to test these ideas um, and specifically what we're asking, is there evidence of pluralistic ignorance when people judge how morally outraged others are on social media is we wanted to conduct a Twitter field study to look at this. And what our hypothesis was specifically was that we would find evidence that there's a discrepancy between ex the uh, message, the expressors reported outraged feelings when they're at the computer or at the phone and a perceiver's judgment of those outraged feelings when they view the message that was being sent. The idea is that outrage will be perceived as more intense than it's actually felt. So how do we go about testing this idea? So we conducted a Twitter field study and we did this in two phases. In the first phase, <clears throat> we identified two topics with that we expected to have high amounts of moral outrage expression. And as we've done in previous studies, um, we're basically in this in the US, you can do this very easily. You're waiting for a controversial thing to happen in US politics. And we did these studies pretty recently. So what we were looking at was the US Supreme Court confirmation hearings regarding the the new um, Justice Amy Comey Barrett. And this was highly controversial in the US uh, from both sides of the political spectrum. And we were also looking at the general topic of voting before the, the 2020 election because this uh, we conducted these um, these this field study in October of 2020. Um, we've run multiple field studies, but I'm going to focus on our largest pre-registered uh, version. So then what we're doing once we identify these topics is we're using our outrage classifier from the last section and we're classifying tweets in real time as the conversations were unfolding. And we're looking for people who our classifier thinks likely express moral outrage. And then we're looking for tweets also that our classifier thinks did not express outrage. And then what we do is we have a script that in real time is sending a message. Once we identify that they express outrage or not, it sends a message to a user asking them to report on how outraged they actually felt. And we do this through the direct message system of Twitter. And we also do this from our this active research account that we sort of we keep it active so people know it's not like a fake account, which you can go follow if you'd like. But we're streaming uh, tweets and we're sending messages and collecting data for about a week in October of 2020. And with this method, we were able to get 200 responses from users. And this was 100 responses from users who we identified as expressing outrage and 100 from people who we identified as not expressing outrage. <clears throat> and um, for us, this represented a 10% response rate, which we felt pretty good about giving that we're sort of just cold messaging people from this account that they um, have, some of them have not seen before. 
So then we store the data. So we have the tweet of the author and their self-report of both outrage. And we also ask them for a, a contrast emotion. We ask them about their happiness as well. And then we have a second phase where we actually then are displaying these tweets to a new group of political partisans uh, in the US. And what we're doing is asking them to judge how outraged each person who tweeted the message was using the same exact scale that we asked the original authors. So this allows us for the first time to directly compare the feelings that a person you know, reported sitting at their computer or their phone when they sent the tweet to how people perceivers judge that they feel. And we ran this phase two within one day of phase one. So all the tweets make sense to these participants. They understand the general context in American politics. Now, the first thing that I'll flag is that um, we see that users responded to our message with a median response time of 1.85 hours. And we think that this validates the method as a really good way to get self reports of, of emotional feelings from tweets as close to the time of sending the tweet as possible. Um, other experience sampling methods I've seen have tried to do this and our method is getting it um, like four times as quickly as they, they were doing it on average. Um, we also purposely ran our script with a schedule that roughly matches the distribution of active hours on Twitter. So we're trying to get around like, you know, time of day effects in terms of how people feel emotions. But the first thing I'll show you results wise are some descriptives. And what I'm showing you is the mean self-reported outrage for the authors who are classified by our model as expressing outrage or not. And what we can see is that there is a significant difference. Uh, so people classified as outrage report that they're feeling more, more outrage. And this is showcasing some of the validity of our classifier regarding feelings, not just expression. Um, but I think this is actually a really impressive result because we were collecting these very contentious topics. So a lot of people, even when they clearly weren't expressing outrage or didn't look like they were in terms of their message, they still reported feeling some outrage because they were generally, you know, upset by the political topic. So we, I think this is actually quite a conservative test of the validation, but um, in phase two, we recruited 190 political partisans from the US and we had every tweet from phase one have uh, 10 Republicans and 10 Democrats make judgments about how outraged that uh, message author was and, and everyone rated about 15 tweets total. So now I'll show you uh, some of the, the main results here. So on the Y axis, I'm plotting the outrage ratings and the X axis, you can see the source. Did it the rating come from the authors, the perceivers? And the author outrage rating is just the raw scores reported by the authors, but the perceiver outrage ratings are the mean outrage scores made by all the participants who perceived each tweet. So each observation for both sides of the graph is um, representing an individual tweet's outrage rating. And what we see here is in fact evidence that people are systematically at the group level over perceiving the extent to which the author is outraged. And this finding is supporting this hypothesis that constraints of social media platforms for expressing emotions leads to this group level discrepancy between outrage the authors feel and outrage the authors are perceiving. And so this is akin to what is described as pluralistic ignorance uh, when it comes to moral outrage expression. Now, interestingly, this effect only appeared to be specific to outrage perception. So we don't see any evidence for over perception of the other emotion that we ask both authors and perceivers about, which is happiness. And so this is suggesting that this pluralistic ignorance effect is very specific to um, outrage or at least to negative higher high arousal and negative emotions. Um, and okay, so one of the other interesting findings, oh, and one thing I'll mention is that we have now conducted three field deployments and we replicate both of these findings identically in all of the studies. So there does seem to be something um, very consistent about this effect. And the other thing that we see across the studies, which I find very interesting is that the extent to which a perceiver judges there to be more outrage than is actually reported by the message author, so call this over perception of outrage, uh, 
is actually correlated with greater daily social media use. And um, I forgot to put the stats here, but the correlation is small. It's about 0.19. But this idea suggests that the communication norms of the social media environment can help explain people's tendency to overperceive. So there's something about interacting a lot on a daily basis on social media that makes you more likely to overperceive outrage. Now, these are observational findings. I just want to make sure I'm good on time. So I just have a little bit more. Um, so again, we're, we're kind of using this method again, where we like to, you know, look in the field, but then we're also going to conduct some, um, some further behavioral experiments. And one of the big things that we were interested in is not only is there evidence of pluralistic ignorance, which we find, but what are some of the consequences of this effect? So we predicted first that over perceiving outrage in your social network will lead to kind of this vicious cycle where the norms can potentially bias your perception. <clears throat> but once you are over perceiving the outrage, it's also going to amplify the outrage norms even more. So you're going to think that outrage is more normative in your social network. And then secondly, over perceiving outrage can make people think that their social network is more polarized. And the reason why this outcome is really important is because some recent research has shown that it's people's perceptions of their group's polarization rather than actual polarization on issues that can predict how much groups dislike one another. So this is really fascinating work that has um, in the field of what is usually called false polarization. But I think it's, it's really interesting that it's the perceptions of polarization that seem to be really important. So we wanted to study how pluralistic ignorance of outrage can impact these two, these two outcomes. <clears throat> So the last study that I'll talk about today, we tested these ideas by, and this is some brand new stuff, so I'd love to get your feedback on this. Um, basically, what we wanted to do was experimentally induce pluralistic ignorance of outrage. So how do we do that? We randomly assign participants to view one of two different um, simulated Twitter news feeds. And both of the news feeds consisted of tweets that we know are controlling for the underlying outrage feelings of the author because we actually used tweets from our previous field study. So the tweets in both conditions all have the same amount of outrage reported by the authors. But although the feelings of the authors are held constant, the overperception condition is displaying tweets that we that we know from our previous study tend to be overperceived by participants. And so the accurate perception condition displays tweets that we know from our previous study were perceived to be more accurately. So again, the tweets have our control, or sorry, the conditions are controlled identically in terms of how much outrage the message authors appear, but the only difference is that some of these tweets in the out over perception condition we know tend to be over perceived. So there's some bias going on here. And we're exposing participants to one of these two news feeds, and then we have them make judgments about their social network. And the first thing that we note is that participants think the social network who wrote the tweets in the over perception condition both like their in group more and also dislike the out group more. And the outgroup dislike effect is significantly larger. And what I'm showing you is a measure uh, using what is called a feeling thermometer, which is a standard measure of effective polarization, measuring how much groups like and dislike one another. And this is a large effect that, again, is driven by bias because the two conditions are controlled for the same self-report outrage. So the only difference is how people are perceiving those tweets. We also see in the overperception condition that the, the social network is judged to be um, notably more ideologically extreme. Um, we see large effect sizes here, and um, we're just asking participants, you know, how on, on a liberal conservative spectrum, how ideologically extreme do you think this, this social network is? And then the last result I'll show you is testing this idea of um, how pluralistic ignorance can potentially impact norms of outrage expression. And so what we did for participants is expose them to a handful of completely new tweets that they hadn't seen. Uh, I think they viewed 20 new tweets total. And these tweets were varied on 
whether they expressed outrage or whether they were more neutral. They were all tweets about these contentious political topics. So the content is held constant. It's really about did they express themselves using outrage versus expressing themselves in more neutral terms. And we're asking participants to judge all these tweets and make a judgment on the extent to which the tweet would be socially appropriate for people to post in the network that they viewed. And now what I'm showing you is a different score between the appropriateness, social appropriateness ratings of high outrage tweets compared to more neutral political tweets. And higher values on this uh, y-axis indicate that participants thought the outrage tweets were more appropriate relative to neutral tweets. And again, all the tweets were about political issues, so it's really about the appropriateness of this specific mode of outrage, of expression using outrage. And we see that, in fact, people in the over-perception condition judge high outrage tweets to be significantly more socially appropriate uh, compared to the accurate perception condition. So, <clears throat> in summary, um, for this part of the talk, social media users, we see evidence across multiple field studies. They, they seem to systematically over-perceive how outraged message authors are. And this is evidence of pluralistic ignorance at the group level regarding moral outrage expression. This is important because, as we show in our studies, over-perception of outrage can impact group-level perceptions. And this includes group polarization, ideological extremity, and also norms of outrage expression, which could potentially create this you know, cycle that can lead to more and more extremity depending on the social network that one is in. <clears throat> and then to give a broader conclusion um, about the general theme of this work, what, what I've shown, I think, is that various elements of the digital social environment on social media can amplify our existing psychological tendencies, and it can do it in ways that make us more likely to express and perceive moral emotions like outrage. And these emotions play a pivotal role in group functions, so this can have important implications for group dynamics, as I've shown in these, in these last studies. So I think, you know, what my work is suggesting so far is that to understand our moral and our emotional lives in the digital age, we really have to consider an interaction of both our psychology and the technology in terms of you know, the environments that we're interacting in. Because these platforms are not at all neutral, even though sometimes tech companies will tell you this, but at the same time, you know, we aren't neutral either. Because we come to these platforms with these, you know, these deep-seated tendencies that have been shaped by our evolutionary history in small groups. And so if we have this perspective in mind that it's really about the interaction, I think we can better understand individual and group behavior as we're interacting in these environments more and more. And, and these interactions are having more consequences for, um, you know, group level phenomena like politics and morality. So that's all I have for today. I want to say thanks to my collaborators. Um, some of you know Molly, she's great. And the, the sort of combination of psychologists and data scientists and political scientists that I work with. It's been it's been a really fun experience. And I also lastly I'll flag that our classifier is is now available open source. So if you want to check it out, it's a package you can get it at, um, on Python um, and try to classify some of your own tweets based on outrage. And I'm working on our version of it as well, but we'll see how long that takes. Um, so thanks so much and that's all I have. Wonderful, thank you, William. Fascinating topic.